Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's part two in the Laser 128 series. I did a lot of talking about this machine in the last part, so if you haven't watched it, check that out. On this video, I'm gonna do a little bit less long-winded talking on things like the box and the specs, and we'll actually get into what this machine is capable of and test out some of the cool features on this thing. So I think without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, so it was in the last video that I was able to validate that this machine definitely turns on, but I didn't even run any software on it. So I have a little pile of disks here. We have Epic Summer Games, Hacker, Dazzle Draw, and Fat City. So first let me just validate that this thing actually runs some software. So let's turn this thing on. Here we go. Sounds like it's working. So let's pop in my favorite disk to test with, Fat City. Let's see how this thing works. So I'm open Apple, control reset, or open triangle. And let's see if this game works. Sounds like it's working normally. There it is. <laughs> All right, I think you have to wait for this intro here. Let's just make sure the game works normally. Keyboard. All right, everything looks good. Let's see how I move around. There we go. Yep, this looks great. Excellent. Next up, a copy of Epic Summer Games. Notice it's on an actual original Apple II disc, like back from the day, back in the day disc. All right, so that's working. Summer Games worked great. I played a little bit of it. Now we're gonna look at Hacker. Oh, cracked on in 1985 by Mr. Clean. So far so good, Hacker is working well. And notice the text has a little bit of color fringing around it. If I switch the switch here that from color to mono, uh, that should clear up that color fringing, and it does. See how much sharper it looks? It's still a little soft, and that's just a setting I have on the Retro Tank. It's, it's really emulating a composite monitor, but that color fringing is gone. So that's a very handy feature of this machine. If we flip from color to mono on this screen, there it is, the color just sort of goes away. Now I'm gonna switch the Retro Tank into a high resolution mode. And there it is, you can see that the text is much sharper, but now in the blue section, or what was blue, you can see those vertical lines. And that's just part of the artifact color that all Apple IIs generate. The game Hacker was working perfectly, so let's try out Dazzle Draw, which is a paint program that uses double high-res graphics. So Control Delete. I keep saying that. Open Apple Control Reset. Let's see how this works. Ah, look at that. That's that nice double high-res splash screen there. The flashing you saw there is simply the retro tank. Okay, I don't have a mouse plugged in, but we'll hit enter anyways. And the machine crashed. That is interesting. This disc definitely works. Now I just noticed something that the 4080 column switch here is currently set to 40. Now let's try PR number three. So that doesn't work. That's the 80 column mode. That should go into 80 column mode. And I'm wondering if this switch on the laser actually has an effect. I can guarantee you that on the Apple IIc, if you switch that switch to 40 column mode, everything that's designed for 80 columns, including PR number three, works perfectly. But I'm wondering if on this machine, setting this to 40 actually disables the 80 column hardware. Well, not totally, because that splash screen on Dazzle Drive we just saw, that's actually 80 column, because that's double high res. But it's still, I can't even do PR number three without it just hanging up right here. So let me flip the switch to 80, and now let's see what happens. Nope, still nothing. Well, let me turn the computer off and on. Okay, PR number three. Look at that. This is working now. Wow, so that's an interesting idiosyncrasy of this machine. So if you are working on a Laser 128 and you find that software is not working properly that uses 
double high res or it uses uh, the 80 column mode, check that switch. It should always be left in the 80 column mode. Pretty sure that on the Apple IIc, and I think people can mention this in the comments, on the IIc, if you set that for 40 columns mode, that simply sets a flag or a bit somewhere in memory. So programs that are designed to look for that bit can do so to say, oh, I'll run in 40 column mode versus 80 column mode because the user has asked for that based on the switch. This machine literally takes the approach of, we'll just kill the 80 column hardware altogether so that it, it just forces it to run in 40 column, but it actually makes things incompatible, well, I think. So I put the disc back in, let's reboot the machine, and now let's see if Dazzle Draw actually runs properly. And I'm gonna switch the retro tape back to color. All right, if I hit enter, this is where it crashed, right here. Oh, it's working. That was actually the fix. All right, 4080 column switch. There it is. With Dazzle Draw running, I wanna see if a mouse works on this machine. Now on the box, it talked about the fact we could use an actual Apple mouse. This is a Macintosh mouse and I have a Mac to 2C adapter on here. I don't actually own the original Apple 2C mouse. I do have a couple other of these Mac mice. It's uh, model MOM0100. I have some of these that work perfectly on the Apple IIc without an adapter. But several months ago, a viewer sent in this adapter for mail call, and I always keep it on this Platinum mouse since it does not work without it, and I use this thing for testing. Because all the Mac mice that I have that work, I, those are set aside to be used on Macintoshes. All right, so that's plugged into the back port. See if this works. There it is. It's working. It's really slow, but that, that's actually how it is on the Apple IIc as well. I flipped the disc over here and I'm gonna load a picture here, Monarch. When I was a kid, I used this paint program and I remember loading this picture up for the first time and being completely wowed. There it is, look at that, double high res, 16 color graphics here. And it looks good, it looks really good. So you can paint on things, you can pick a color here to paint on it. So, uh, you know, obviously I am no artist but with the mouse, it does allow you to be somewhat creative. And this program is working perfectly. So I'm excited to know that the internal floppy drive is working and that the mouse port is completely compatible with the Apple II mouse. If you noticed in Dazzle Draw, things were a little bit sluggish in that program. It's just not very fast when you're interacting with double high res. So I thought it would be interesting to try the faster speeds on this machine. So I did a little bit of research to try to figure out how you change the speeds on this machine. And it turns out the way you do it is when you reboot the machine or when you power it on, you hold down one, two, or three. One is for one megahertz, two is for that two point something megahertz speed, was it 2.8? And three, I think is 3.6. I'm probably getting those numbers wrong, but it's three different speeds. So one way to tell an Apple II what speed things are running at is listen to the beep. I press control G here. That's the normal beep of this machine. Reset, there's the faster beep, and let's do three. Oh, it's even higher pitch now. Now the pitch there is different based on speed. That doesn't happen like on a PC, like Turbo XTs or any PC when you hit the turbo button. The beep sounds don't change. And that's because on a PC, the beep you hear out of the speaker is generated by a timer on the motherboard inside the chipset. But on an Apple II, the beep, well, everything that you hear out of the speaker is literally controlled by assembly language routine that just loops and reads a memory address. Every time you read that memory address, it creates a tick on the speaker. So if you read it quickly enough, you create a tone. Because that timing loop is strictly based on execution of machine code by the processor, when you speed up the processor, that whole timing loop runs a lot faster and therefore the sound changes. That has a very detrimental effect on game performance. On a PC again, I'm going back to PCs, games are able to check how fast a computer is by using those internal timers. That, that way they can adjust their speed so that the game speed is consistent even when you're running on a faster machine. On an Apple II, because there is no timer in hardware, there is no way for a game to know that the processor is running faster. So if I boot up a game, let's, let's run in the second speed here. So I'm in speed number two. We'll put in Fat City here, boot the game up. It's gonna to be too fast. And that's just a problem on Apple IIs. It's 
So like, <laughs> so that was just, uh, the music was faster, everything was faster. The game is gonna play faster. Now in some cases that might be a good thing because for instance, maybe the game is too slow and you need a speed boost to make it playable. I don't know, like some tank game or something. But a game that's already running at a good speed before you speed up the machine, it's just gonna be too fast. So I'd say that this game is still, well, it's pretty fast. It's totally playable. But the issue is that the timer, like the fuel gauge on the right there, that's gonna go down faster because this game doesn't know that it's running at a faster speed. Let's reboot out of here again and we'll switch over to the third speed. I have the speaker turned all the way down, let's see. Oop. So there we go. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Even the cursor is flashing much faster now because again, it's based on timing loops inside the processor and not off like the vertical sync or anything like that. And actually it just froze. Let's try something else at the faster speed. Let's try something that isn't gonna be badly affected by the quickness. Dazzle Draw is a perfect example. It was sluggish when it was running at stock speed and that's like that on a real Apple II. So let's see how this runs at the faster speed. Well, I'm gonna say that this program is completely excellent with the speed boost. The menus are very responsive now. Scrolling is gonna be faster. Just everything is gonna be faster. So that's an example of where you really want to have the extra speed. There's that flood fill there. I'll, I'll, let's do an example of that. So here's flood fill running at the top speed and let's do it again running at stock one megahertz speed. And you can just see how much more sluggish the menus are and things. I'll try to draw like a similar thing to what I had on there. <laughs> Okay, so how fast is the flood fill at one megahertz? Really slow. Wow, massive speed boost. So I'm trying to understand why this machine froze up in Fat City and I actually tried a couple other games at high speed and some games work fine, some freeze up and others have graphical corruption. And I can't really figure out the rhyme or reason on what exactly is causing that. Seems like everything works perfectly at the middle speed if I reboot and press two. That always works 100%. I mean, sometimes it's too fast to play or whatever, but it, it works. But three, sometimes is unstable, but other times not. I did play around with Dazzle Draw quite a bit more, running at the top speed there. No problems at all, no freezing, no nothing. It just, it works perfectly. So it's a little bit of a mystery there, what's, what's going on. If you have any experience with this machine in the past, like you have one when it was new, and you can recall it working perfectly at the top speed, or was this always a, a fault with this thing? I'd love to hear about that in the comment section. What I would like to test next is to see if these Apple floppy drives work with this machine, externally that is. Laser had their own drives that they sold, but if you ever acquire one of these machines, almost certainly you're not gonna be able to find some of those drives and you'll wanna end up using these types of drives as external drives. The first drive is a very common one. This is the Apple 5.25 inch disk drive. Extremely common, you found these pretty much always used on the Apple IIe and also the Apple IIgs. But you could plug these straight into an Apple IIc, IIc Plus, even the original Apple II computers if you had the disk controller card that had the standard Apple, what is this, a 19 pin connector. If any drive is gonna work on this machine, it's gonna be this drive. This is, this is basically identical to the internal drive that's on here. So that means this is probably gonna show up as slot six, drive two. I'm gonna boot up the software copy two plus, which is a central point software utility for doing all sorts of stuff with the disk drives. And the good thing about this version, this is uh, version 8.4, is it will enumerate all the drives that are visible on this machine. So let's power this up. Oh, the light blinked for a second, so that's a good sign. All right, ProDOS 1988. So I'm gonna take my Dazzle Draw disc and stick this in the second drive. We'll go down to catalog, normal. All right, so we're seeing slot three, drive two, RAM. Um, I don't remember the exact specifics of this. This shows up on the Apple IIc if I recall, and it is any extra RAM you have, like you can dedicate the upper part of the upper memory to be a RAM disc. 
Now this machine is showing slot five drive one, and I'm wondering if that's the RAM card that's on this machine. Remember the box said this has a built-in RAM card. First, I'm just gonna check this disk drive though. So slot six drive two would be this external drive. If we hit enter, it is accessing it, and there it is. So we're seeing the contents of this dazzle draw disk. That's absolutely working. So regular Apple II five and a quarter inch disk drives, they do work on the Laser 128. So let's look back at this slot five drive one. IO error. Uh, can we try formatting this disk? Pro DOS, ready to format. Okay, it didn't say any error. No, IO error, it's dollar sign 2D. We'll have to try that again once I populate RAM on the RAM card, but that's probably what that's gonna be, some kind of a RAM disk. All right, so the next drive to try is this one here. So this is an Apple 3.5 inch drive. This is a very common one because this was the drive that was used on all of the Apple II GS machines. Now, the whole three and a half inch disk drive situation for Apple IIs is very complicated. Well, Macintosh and Apple IIs. They all use that same connector to plug on the back, but there are a bunch of differences from one to another. So you can't just interchangeably connect one drive type to another. An example of that is this drive right here is widely compatible with all the Macintoshes. In fact, I've plugged this into all sorts of Macs and it's just always worked. It also works perfectly on the 2GS, but this drive does not, I repeat, does not work and is not compatible with the original Apple IIc. It does work on the 2C Plus, and it does work on a 2E if you have the very special card, which I don't remember the name of. It's expensive, and it's a card that's designed to work with this, this drive. Otherwise, you cannot use this drive on a 2E, even one that has the, the connection that goes into this five and a quarter inch drive, which is physically the same as this, don't connect it. It's not compatible. I don't know about any damage occurring if you do try to connect it, but I know for sure that it will not work. So I don't know for sure if it's going to work on this machine either, and it may cause damage for all I know, but the box did seem to indicate that it was compatible with three and a half inch drives regular three and a half inch drives, which is what this is. Now, if you read up about the Apple IIc Plus, and it has an internal three and a half inch drive, which is very much like one of these, the way Apple made that work is they made a special ASIC or application specific IC that had enough horsepower in it to read and write to the disk drive because the regular 6502 processor does not. When Woz released the original Apple II disk drive for the two Apple II series, it was so inexpensive compared to contemporaries because he wrote very efficient routines for talking to the disk drive and you didn't need expensive controllers like he did on PC. But the negative of the way he did it is the, the CPU in the machine has to do the disk IO. Well, one megahertz processors, not very fast and a double density, double-sided disk drive, there's a lot of data going back and forth and it is beyond the capability of the 6502 without a special chip. So it is my belief that the Laser 128 actually has that special ASIC internal to it that is able to drive these types of disk drives. So let's give this a try. It's gonna be my drive to sacrifice or my laser to sacrifice. Hopefully this helps other people who have this machine. All right, so here we go. What's gonna happen? Okay, well, it access the disk. See if pushing the button ejects it. Well, that's a good sign. So it accessed the drive there again. I have a copy of David Murray's attack of the Apple robots, which is his port of Petsky robots to the Apple II on a three and a half inch double-sided disc. Let's stick it in here. Oh, look, we have slot seven drive one now. That's different. Let's hit enter. Look at that, it's freaking working. A2 robots, there it is, ha <laughs> ha. So the Laser 128, at least the EX that I have, is fully compatible with the Apple three and a half inch disk drive and it just works. In fact, let's reboot out of here and try, uh, see if it actually boots that disk. So I'll hit Control Delete. Oh, actually, because this is showing up as slot seven, it's actually gonna boot this before it even boots the internal drive. That's different than the Apple II GS because that assigns the three and a half inch drive as slot five. So because this drive is slot seven and it boots from slot seven and down, it's gonna to try to boot this. 
then the internal drive, and then what I think is in slot five, which is the RAM disk. Next up for testing is the third type of drive, and I'm gonna be using the floppy EMU here for that testing, and it's the smart port drives. On the Apple IIc, it was the first Apple II machine to support what is smart port, and that's the Unidisk drive that I mentioned in part one. That drive has a 6502 processor in it, and basically it's like a packetized protocol over the floppy interface for connecting external storage devices. Now, it doesn't have to be a disk drive, it could actually be a hard drive, and I don't know, but there may have been actual external hard drives, like a 20 meg hard drive, that worked with the original Apple IIc through the floppy port, and that's called smart port. The floppy emu can emulate a smart port hard drive, and on the 2C and on the 2GS, it completely works. In fact, I already have this configured to be a smart port device, and if I plug this into a standard 2C and turn it on, the machine will boot straight up into total replay, which is that game collection for the Apple II. So when I power this on, hopefully it's gonna work and not let the smoke out of my floppy emu. All right, well, it's booting off the internal disk. I need to take that out. Let's reboot again. Oh, it's working. So would you look at that? The Laser 128 pretty much supports all of the external disk drives, including smart port hard drives which means if you get a Laser 128, go ahead and connect your floppy emu up to it, set it up for a hard drive image, and it will just work. When I first power cycled the machine though, it started booting off the drive, and I think that's because the firmware on this takes a moment to actually initialize, and it wasn't ready by the time the computer started booting. What I would like to do next is test out the expansion slot on the side of this thing. I have this Apple II card here. This was sent in on a mail call episode. I forgot the viewer's name, but it takes an SD card and it actually boots a smart port hard drive. It may or may not work in this machine just because of the compatibility. And if that's the case, I'll try a different card, but let's give this a try. And I think before I test that out, we're gonna have to go into this little cover on the bottom here and see about setting some dip switches to assign that slot on the side to be an appropriate slot for that card to boot from. As I was moving the camera to put it up on the bench here so we could look inside here, I heard something fall in the lab and it was the lid of my Apple IIe Platinum. I had taken this off to get the this hard drive card out of that IIe and it was just sitting about a foot and a half off the ground on the top of something else and it slid off and hit the ground. And when that happened, <laughs> this corner just snapped off. So that's a little frustrating here. Uh, I guess the plastic is getting kind of brittle I mean, it's not the end of the world because if, if this lid is sitting on a computer, you don't really notice that it's missing here. But I guess I'm going to have to try to figure out how to glue this on. Maybe some ABS plastic welding is in, in order. It was a relatively clean break, but how frustrating. I mean, this literally barely fell. It obviously just fell in the corner. So anyhow, now on the cover it has a little sticker telling us what these switches inside do. And it's really these two that were that are relevant here. So the external slot is either seven or five, or it's internal. And obviously switching these must most likely disables the internal circuitry for that slot. Well, that three and a half inch floppy drive and the smart port both show up as slot seven. So I don't want to disable that. I more likely want to disable slot five, which I think is a RAM disk or something, it doesn't seem to do anything right now, and make that work as the external slot. So out with those two screws, and then you just sort of push on this. You need some fingernails to get this cover out. Oh, look at that. So the Laser 128 ROM is in here. So that's something. And then the switch that's right there is not even populated. It says PAL version only, not using LCD or using LCD. Well, it's clearly not a PAL version, so that's not even there. But these are the two switches that we have to set. So I'm gonna switch the slot five one into the up position right there. When I'm done with this video, I'll pop this ROM chip out and I'll actually read the contents out and I'll upload that to archive.org or something like that. So uh, check the description if you're interested in a copy of this particular ROM. You may notice here that it says 1986 Language Arts and Video Technology plus copyright Microsoft. I wonder who Language Arts are. They probably have something to do with the development of this clone ROM that this thing uses. And for putting this card into the slot, since this is a small card, it could go either way but I'm going to say it's gonna go this way. And that's because in a real Apple II, when you have a card, the PCB components 
the card connector is right here, but the cards normally go off this direction. Now, if this thing took cards this way, that length of the card would be off over here. And there's no way this is designed this way. So it's gonna be designed this way so the length of the card comes towards the front of the machine. So in other words, when you're putting your card in there, make sure the components are up. I have no disks in the internal drive, nothing's plugged in the back. So if all things work, it should boot off that thing. So is this gonna work? Let's see. All right, well, it's trying to boot off the internal, but that's fine because we made that PR number five, right? Here we go. Aha, not working. Oddly typing PR number five just booted the internal disk drive again. So I'm not quite sure what's happening there. PR number seven, clearly, it just says unable to boot because I don't have an external drive plugged in, but definitely PR number five just weirdly boots the internal drive and the light doesn't even flash on this thing. So don't worry that this doesn't work because I have some more cards here. The one that I'm gonna try that really should just work is this one here. So this is just a standard Apple II disc controller card and I would plug that external floppy drive into it. If this thing works, make sure the computer is off. Then I have another card to test here, which I'll get to in a second. This standard Apple disc controller supports this drive, which I was using earlier. So let's see if this works. It should show up at slot five now. Okay, no smoke. And nope, it's not seeing it. We're seeing slot six. Slot five is just gone. Remember that it was showing up before as like a RAM disc or something, but it is not there anymore. So if I reboot out of this and we check PR number five, I predict. So it's just acting weird. What's happening? PR number five, it's just not working. It's crashing. I'm just gonna switch this to slot seven, the external one, by flipping the two switches around here. Let's see if that changes anything. I don't have the card connected. I'm just gonna hit PR number five, and now we get unable to boot. So that is the, that's what it says normally. I didn't show that before, but if you try to hit PR number five, that's what it would do. And PR number seven was also doing that if I didn't have a disk drive plugged in. And now it's acting as if nothing is in there. So let's plug this in. I don't have a lot of confidence that this is gonna work. Whoa, hey, it's working. Let me stick copy two plus in here. All right, well, that works. So this slot does work, but I guess there's a little bit of idiosyncrasies with what can be slot five and what can be slot seven. So let's turn off the power and let's go back to this card. Let's see if this works as slot seven. Hey, the light's on. That's a good sign. Hey, that totally works. So we should be able to scroll through a couple different games. Oh, this is, it loads, by the way, much, much faster than the smart port emulation through Floppy Emu. Like I can just tell navigating through the, the screens there, loading a game here, that loads much more quickly. Incidentally, let's just see the speed of Load Runner on the Apple II and I'll reboot this computer in one of the turbo speeds and we will see how unplayable this comes becomes. Okay, so this is the normal speed. If I fall down here, it falls. Okay, okay, I'm gonna restart the computer with three held down. There we go, we heard that high pitch beep. Okay, so let's see, load runner, here we go. Well, this doesn't seem any faster. I don't think it's actually running at a faster speed. No, this is still normal speed. What happened there? Let's try rebooting again. Okay, so it's definitely running in the fast speed. So there's one thing that I think is happening here. If this game is exactly the same speed, what's happening is the Laser 128 actually has, yeah, this is no faster. So the Laser 128 actually has a couple, I think it's like a couple bits in one memory location, allows you to toggle the fast speed on or off. And I bet you the developers of Total Replay actually went in there and configured it where it toggles this thing into slow mode, it forces it into slow mode, and they knew they, they did that on purpose because they knew that the Laser 128 was just gonna be too fast running at the high speed for these games, so you might as well just force it into the slow speed. All right, so that's cool. So this, this slot does work as seven for the disc controller and this. So probably disc type cards, maybe they only work as seven and five is a little more restricted. What this card is that I wanna test 
is a CPM card. It's the applied engineering one of this card. I have shown the Microsoft card on my channel before. Let's see if this works as five or seven. And this is absolutely something that an Apple IIc cannot do. There might have at one point been an Apple IIc CPM card that, that mounted the board inside the Apple IIc. I'm not totally sure about that. But these types of CPM cards for going in slots on Apple IIs were very common. And like I had mentioned in one of my previous videos, we had one of these in my Apple II Plus. So when I had my IIc, I was kind of sad to have lost that CPM capability. I mean, not that I was playing more games and stuff, but I did do some programming and I liked having CPM as an option. So I think that was one of the things on, when I saw the Laser 128 EX had a slot, that was one of the features where I was like, oh, I, I could use CPM again. And yeah, I guess the card would hang off the side like this, but here's a copy of Apple II CPM 2.23. Let's see, <laughs> will this boot? Let's see what happens. I'm not really expecting this to work, but it might. Oh, it freaking works. It freaking works. I am shocked. How, whoa, whoa, okay. It sort of works, but it actually isn't controlling the disk drive properly. It could be this particular version of CPM, uh, Apple II CPM 63K by Datasoft. There's, there are several versions of CPM. This is the one floppy disk that I had. If I take the card out of the machine and I power back on, you will see that it will not boot properly into CPM. Yep, can't find the stupid card. What kind of version of CPM is this? This is hilarious. Let me fiddle with the switches to make this external slot slot five, and then I can boot my floppy emu where I have a few different copies of CPM on there. Okay, so this is configured to slot five now. Let me power it up with this same version of CPM. Let's see if we get that error message. Okay, it's just hanging at this point. So really this thing is finicky when it comes to running at slot five. I'm almost thinking that what happens is this thing kind of defaults to slot seven. It's physically wired for slot seven because on Apple IIs, each slot has slightly different wiring because they are, slot seven is always assigned to slot seven. When you put a card in there, that's how it knows it's in, in slot seven because of the way that it's wired. This slot must be wired that way as well. And I bet you slot five is accessible when you have the external cha expansion chassis, which has slot five and seven in it. You can use both cards simultaneously. And then those switches on the bottom of the computer are used to assign whether the internal functions on this machine are mapped into the memory of slot five and slot seven or not. So the fact is right now, this is acting like it's in slot seven electrically, but the computer is decoding slot seven to be the internal circuitry. So it's actually a bus conflict probably happening right now. And just in case anyone's wondering, I have the floppy emu connected right now, but I have the switches set to assign slot seven to the external connector here. And this does, it, you know, powers up, but it's not seen. I can't boot from it or anything. So absolutely, you can't, can't run external disk drives and things and the side slot at the same time. This presents a little bit of an inconvenience for me because I need the floppy emu, which shows up as slot seven to boot those other versions of CPM, or I need to make a disk. I'm gonna go make a disc. I was about to set up an Apple IIc to use ADT Pro from this old laptop to make some discs, but then I realized I should try to do it on here because the serial ports should be compatible. And I have a cable here, which I made, I don't know, ages ago, that has the Apple IIc DIN that goes to a normal nine pin. And then using a no modem adapter, I can connect it to this USB adapter to this laptop and that should work. This is what I normally use for making discs. And in case anyone is curious, you cannot use the floppy emu as a source to make disks from. So I originally thought I could use the floppy emu boot up copy to plus and literally make a copy of a disk that was mounted on the floppy emu onto a real floppy disk. That does not work. It just doesn't work. I don't know exactly why, but I've tried it many times, non-functional. With the card called the booty, it's very similar to how this one works, except it's newer and it does allow you to make floppy disks from stuff stored on its flash memory. Now, I don't have one of those to test with yet, although I know I have one in my waiting to open mail call packages. So if, if anyone's thinking of sending me one, you don't need to, there's already one in there. But in the meantime, I use ADT Pro 
to create disks. So I'm going to plug this DIN connector into what is the modem port on the back of this, which is slot two, I am pretty sure. We will hit configure. So super serial card slot two. I have it set to use a baud rate of 15,200 because that's what works on the Apple IIc. But I'm going to set it to 19.2, which I think might be all this thing supports. I guess we could try both. I guess let's start at 15.2 and see if I can get it working. On the host machine, I always set Apple IIc image writer cable, and that seems to make my cable work. And I'm going to leave it at 15,200 on this end. So that has started. And let's do directory. Waiting for host reply, host timeout. Okay, so that's not working. I'm gonna switch this down to 19200. I gotta do the same on here. Disconnect. Yeah, let's see if we hit serial now and we hit directory. There it is, it's working. So there's a limitation that the Laser 128 does not run at 115200 and the Apple IIc does. I'm gonna overwrite this copy of CPM I had here that didn't seem to work right correctly. I'll do a format first. And then let's receive one of these CPM disks. We'll do Apple CPM. I think that's more likely to be one that actually works. It's going to go a lot slower than it would on the Apple II just because that baud rate situation. So what about one-fifth the speed? So now I wait. Image transfer aborted? What just happened there? I'll try a different disk here. I don't, I don't know. This disk could be bad. It keeps aborting, and I actually don't know what's going on. I haven't seen this particular behavior before. I guess I'm just going to have to break out the Apple IIc here and try on that. And I'm back. I had no trouble making these discs with ADT Pro on the Apple IIc, so it could be that the serial port on this thing is just not up to par, even for 19,200 baud, which the IIc had no problem at 115,200. So. Keep that in mind, if you are trying to make disks on the Laser 128, it may not work. And I was running at the stock speed, by the way. So let's try this CPM. I just, this is the Apple CPM here. I have the applied engineering card in there. It's still set to be slot seven. Here we go. Okay, so now it says Microsoft, same problem. You know, this, this, this might have actually been the same version that someone just hex edited or changed the banner to Datasoft from Microsoft, like it was a pirated version <laughs> that they were giving out and they didn't want it to be byte for byte the same. But it, look, it just crapped out in exactly the same way as the other one. Let me just try the other copy of CPM I have here. I'm not sure what the difference is. I had just downloaded several ones onto the floppy emu from the internet. Let's see about this one. Uh, this looks like similar version. Hey, this one doesn't crash though. Look, this one actually works. The difference is this one seems to have 44K of free RAM and the other one had a bit more. So maybe, I'm not sure what the difference is there with that 2.20 and the other one was maybe 2.23B, something like that. But look at that CPM on a Laser 128 G Basic. What's this? Basic 80, there it is. 10 print. Hello there. Uh, see if lowercase works. Lowercase, it works perfectly. Uppercase, it works as well. System takes you back to CPM. Now, is everyone curious? What happens if I run the computer at full speed, three point whatever megahertz? Pretty much the computer is gonna slow down whenever the card is being accessed. So I have a feeling it won't really make any difference, but it might. So let's give it a try. Ha, look at that, it just crashes immediately. Nope, how about the middle speed? There you go. Nope, just a little glitching on the screen there. It's back to slow speed. Reboot. Uh-oh. I 
think it's corrupted the disc. Isn't that interesting? Yep. That disc got corrupted by all of those shenanigans. That can happen on the Apple II because the disk drive is so controlled by the CPU, errant code doing crazy things. If the disk were right protected, that would not have happened. <laughs> that was simply because it was crashing while trying to boot. But let me just go back to this other copy of CPM, the one that didn't work the first time. Yeah, 2.2B and it has 56K of RAM now versus the 44 but then it doesn't work when you hit enter. Fascinating. Well, unfortunately, I have to call it quits for this video. It's getting rather long and there's still a lot more to cover on the Laser 128. I have a little list of things I need to get through and test out. So I'll be bringing that to you in part three coming up very soon. I wanna give a big thank you to all my patrons whose names are scrolling up the side of this video right now. It means so much to me, all the support I've been getting. And if you like this video, as usual, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to check out my second channel. If you want to become a patron yourself, you can check the link in the description. And I think I mentioned everything. Comments below if you don't like it. You know, all that youtube -y stuff. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.